Hello guys and welcome back to the 8th episode of my series about Italian presidents, where I don't just talk about the president of the Republic of Italy, but also whatever was happening in Italy at the time. Last time we talked about Sandro Pertini, the first socialist president that conquered the hearts of all the people he met and probably the best president Italy ever had. It will be hard to top that, but not impossible. Today we are talking about Francesco Cossiga, the youngest president ever and arguably one of the most influential so far. Last episode we overlooked the figure of Cossiga in order to focus more on Pertini, at least that was my intention. Looking back at it I, I don't think I gave enough uh, justice to Cossiga. He was a great prime minister at the time and his term as president will be just as marvelous. Cossiga was minister of the interior during the kidnapping of Aldo Moro, prime minister during the height of the years of lead and president of the republic when the Berlin wall fell. These are three incredibly crucial historical events which will shape his personality, making him a complicated yet amusing subject to study. Cossiga arguably has the most interesting and intense pre-presidential history in our series so far, so let's get right into it. Cossiga was born in 1928 in Sassari. You can say politics was in his blood because Segni was his uncle and Enrico Berlinguer, head of the Communist Party, was his cousin. He graduated in law when he was 20 and joined the Democrazia Cristiana when he was just 17. If he hadn't been so young, he would have actually joined the Constituent. In fact, he was the first president of the Republic that didn't actively contribute to the writing of the Constitution. There was something Cossiga did contribute to, however, secret societies. Cossiga, in his younger days, was part of a secret paramilitary group called Gladio. Now, Gladio was not like Propaganda Due, it was a secret institutional branch that included a good portion of the DC and military personnel, and its purpose was to stop any attempt of a communist takeover. It really didn't do much after the mess with Seni and De Lorenzo. As we already said, time and time again, if you put aside Segni's delirium, it was actually normal at the time to, to have a plan against a communist takeover, and even then Cossiga really didn't have any involvement with Gladio. Keep in mind that he was just a nobody in parliament before he became undersecretary of defense in 1966. Despite the clear fact that Gladio was nothing more than a product of the time, many people today just assume he was one of the people to be blamed for the years of lead and the death of Moro, but that couldn't be further from the case. Guess who was the one to reveal Cossiga's involvement in Gladio in an attempt to discredit him? Oh, would you look at that? Gladio aside, Cossiga had a very good reputation in his party and outside it. He was brilliant, stubborn yet eloquent, traits that won him the admiration of Moro and the rest of the party who had him in their cabinets as Minister of Internal Affairs for many years. Cossiga was particularly fond of the friendship he had with Moro, so when he eventually passed, it took a very big toll on him. On May 11th, 1978, he will resign from his post and spend a year in Sassari, the city he was born in and had a strong attachment to. He will stay there to mentally recover until Pertini called him back to Rome one year later to run his own cabinet. He will be once more faced with death left and right, to the point that when he was elected president in 1985, all that seemed to be left of Cossiga was a tired old man plagued by his own demons. After the turbulent Pertini presidency, Andreotti managed to put another Christian Democrat in the Quirinale, someone that he assumed would be easy to push around like Leone, and it seemed so in the beginning, at least until the end of the Cold War, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, Cossiga's election was very straightforward. It had like one scrutiny and he won with like 75% of the votes. Cossiga had won the respect of the parliament thanks to his work as prime minister. He was also able to set in motion the end of the years of lead and build great relations with West Germany due to the whole missile affair I talked about last episode. It is important to point out that Cossiga's election happened in a relatively stable time 
time in the Republic, the Communists were losing ground due to the sudden disappearance of Berlinguer, who had died of a stroke in 1984, and Kraxe's cabinet was pretty much under control. That being said, it wasn't perfect, the Mafia Wars were still taking place in Sicily and Kraxe's policies were also piling up on, on public debt, but that's another story for another episode. Between 1985 and 1989, Cosiga's presidency was uneventful for the most part. He had become the opposite of Pertini. He was reserved, careful, distant and seemingly cold. He spoke with long, intricate sentences rather than colloquial ones and didn't do much to appeal to the people who felt distant from Cosiga. He traveled a lot in Africa, Australia, North America, Russia, Germany and Ireland. The latter he was particularly fond of. He was also responsible for the renovation of the Quirinale and other presidential buildings that had sort of been abandoned by Pertini, he also hired a lot of new personnel from Sardinia so that he could feel more at home. The only moment of tension during the first phase of his presidency will be the end of Craxi's first and longest cabinet, when Craxi refused to release to the US the Palestinian terrorist Abu Abbas, who had hijacked an Italian cruise ship called MS Achille Lauro and thrown a disabled Jewish man on a wheelchair off the ship. Craxi refused to cooperate with Reagan, probably in order to preserve national authority, which angered the Republican Party, which joined the opposition as a result of Craxi's anti-American behavior. Negotiations became possible only when Cosiga sided with Craxi. In exchange for some extra public approval, Craxi had to remake a cabinet from the ground up, although with the same five parties that had been nicknamed Pentapartito. This party alliance included the liberals, the republicans, democrazia cristiana, the social democrats and the socialists. At this point in time ideologies really had no use and politics had frozen as a symptom of the cold war. However, Crux's second government won't be as stable as the last one, forcing Cosiga to call for elections once again in 1987, ending Crux's time as PM and giving the cabinet to Fanfani so that he could run the country while everybody else was busy campaigning. The beef in Cosiga's term really took place after the fall of the Berlin Wall, which was the breaking point of the Republic according to him. Andreotti was opposed to the end of the Cold War because he knew that the only reason why the DC existed was to fight against the PCI, and he was right. Italy was an unhealthy democratic system where there was no exchange of power between left and right parties. Cosiga and Andreotti both knew this, but the latter had no interest in changing, because introducing a power exchange would doom partitocrazia and therefore also Andreotti's power. However, Cosiga knew how corrupt and static the system was, and with the end of the Cold War he saw an opportunity to make a proper change and to drop his silent act. Now Cosiga's presidency after 1989 has him going through a complete change of character. He became one of the most interventionist presidents of the Republic. He will try to encourage systematic reforms that would dramatically change the way politics and representation worked in the country. The Cold War was over and so the Partitocrazia had its days numbered. Cosiga will declare war onto the old establishment and will send back to parliament the highest number of laws for them to revaluate. He will also send the most messages to parliament, six of them, which greatly surpassed the usual one or two each president before him had sent. The most important of his messages was sent in July 1991 and it described and encouraged a, a potential republican reform that would have reduced the power of parties significantly. However, he met little to no support and and so he changed his approach completely. He will yell a lot and insult any politician at the time, specifically Craxi and Andreotti, but the others were far from safe. His rants were characterized by a more colloquial language, however not the same type of colloquialism that Bertini used. His language was a lot less institutional. Cosiga had changed from the personification of the institutions to its worst enemy, from the guardian of the establishment to its biggest reformer. He will 
spend the last few years of his term by exposing all the flaws of the parties and the system they were part of, by ridiculizing them through irony and satire. He suddenly became very famous among the people, at the cost that everybody else was becoming unpopular. Newspapers called Cosiga delirious, but as Cosiga will later explain, he acted crazy in the hopes of unfreezing the system. Not only that, but he assigned nicknames to his colleagues. Achille Occhetto, secretary of the Communist Party, would be known as Zombie with a Mustache, Ciriaco de Mita, head of Democrazia Cristiana, and prime minister after Craxi resigned between 1987 and 1988, was called Lepidus of Nusco. Luciano Violante, a communist member of the Chamber of Deputies and noted for his more authoritarian views, was called Little Vashinsky, which was the name given to Stalinist judges in Russia at the time of Stalin, of course. Cosiga will receive a nickname of his own, Il Picconatore, which means someone who breaks stuff with a pickaxe. He was very happy of the nickname, because his goal was to earth what he saw as a broken institution, damage that could be only resolved not by fixing, but by rebuilding everything from the ground up. Nothing could stop Cosiga, not even when he was almost impeached by the reveal of his past links with Gladio. Andreotti had brought this up in Parliament probably because he hoped to force him to resign. When the communists heard of this, they demanded his resignation, and seeing that the DC didn't even try to defend him, Cosiga crossed his arms and remained where he was, refusing to cooperate. If you guys remember, this was not the first time it happened. Just 12 years before or so, Giovanni Leone was demanded to resign by the communists, and the DC refused to back him up due to the multiple scandals he was blamed of. Many people today believe that Leone was used as the scapegoat by the DC to distract public opinion from the real scandals. Cosiga was prime minister at the time and clearly remembered what happened to Leone afterwards, and so he refused to share his fate. By this point, all the pieces were coming together. It was suddenly becoming clear to the public who the puppet master of Partitocrazia and the Republic really was. Andreotti was clearly up to something. Cosiga tried to continue what Pertini was doing, but without the charm and the charisma that had characterized his predecessor. It was successful at first. Cosiga's frequent interventions led to the birth of a new type of journalist, Il Quirinalista, someone whose job is to cover all the news involving the president of the Republic, something which was necessary for newspapers at the time to be able to stay on track with all of Cosiga's insults, though the president's popularity wouldn't last. Just like most things in his life, Cosiga came early. He graduated a few years in advance and became minister and prime minister a significant amount of years before his contemporaries. In 1989, five years before 1994 and the whole corruption scandal of Tangentopoli that involved every single party, Cosiga had predicted everything and was acting likewise. His rants did nothing to break the institutions that might have actually gotten stronger after Cosiga almost got impeached. Regardless of whatever people thought of him, he will resign 10 weeks before the end of his term, mostly for convenience's sake, since the election of the new president would also take place at the same time as the new parliamentary elections, so he just decided to leave early. But his resignation speech sent a message, a big one at that, and will pave the way for his successor to end what he had started. Cosiga was relatively young, when he ended his term, so when the DC eventually died down after the scandals that we will discuss in the next episode, he made his own centrist party that tried to follow its old steps. Sadly, it only lasted until 1999, but I don't want to get sidetracked. He spent the remaining years of his political life in the Senate, until his passing in uh, 2010. Before dying, he refused a state funeral and was instead buried in his hometown. Sassari, in his family section of the cemetery, not too far from where Saini rests. Cosiga is seen by many as a lost opportunity. Even he would admit to that when he will look back uh, with remorse at his rants. Maybe if he had adopted a more institutional behavior, he would have been able to achieve more changes. But things did change, perhaps not as drastically as Cosiga anticipated, but it was more than enough. Next time we will talk about Oscar Luis. 
Luigi Scalfaro and the transition from what we call the First and the Second Republic. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate if you could like, comment and subscribe. In the description, I also have a Discord and a PayPal link. Feel free to join my community and to donate me whatever you see fit if you want to see more of my content. That being said, have a good one guys, I will see you next time.